Good evening. I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Maricopa Community College District Governing Board for February 27th at 2018. I'd like to begin by welcoming Mr. Augustine Bartney to our, our first regular meeting. I see we've got a lot of people here to celebrate his first meeting and welcome him to the board. Did that again. Thank you for having me. No, no, no. Thank you for electing me or appointing me. <laughs> Thank you for appointing me as well. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure how much we had to do with that, but welcome. Uh, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. We led by Felicia Ibarra and Jalen Cooper. Okay, substitutions. I got to get reorganized after the coffee here. Colleen Charleston O'Neill for Jan Geller. Student life report to Straya Mountain Community College. Good evening, Governing Board members, Chancellor Dr. Harper Marinick, CEC, and distinguished guest. My name is Felicia Ivara, and I'm a student ambassador in the Office of Student Life and Leadership. Along with me tonight is Jalen Cooper, who is also a student ambassador at Australia Mountain Community College. Tonight, we will be talking to you about student life and leadership, fitness and wellness, and past and upcoming events. Student life and leadership provides an environment which fosters the social, academic, and professional growth and development in a student. We are located in the Student Union, which is the central hub for students on campus. We currently serve over 600 students, staff, faculty, and community members on a weekly basis. Some of our services include campus tours, our student food pantry, discounted bus passes, Lions Exchange Boutique, campus managed posting boards, leadership development, child care assistance, and student retention. The Lions Exchange Boutique opened in January of 2018. It provides gently used clothing items at no cost for EMCC students. Students along with faculty and staff can donate items to support students as they pursue their academic and career goals. Students can come twice a month and get up to four items each visit. The Student Food Pantry opened in 2014 and it is housed in the Student Union. During the 2017-2018 school year, there has been a dramatic increase in the number of students coming to the pantry. In previous years, throughout the school year, we served 1,000 students and we are currently up to serving 3,000 students. EMCC has over 20 active clubs and organizations. Um, <clears throat> have, we have sponsored over 82 campus managed and community events this academic school year. Some of those events include Sexual Assault Awareness, Welcome Week, Me Too Campaign, Business Expo, Mental Health Awareness Tabling, and more. Many clubs also volunteer to help set up the St. Mary's Food Bank held at EMCC's campus, the Veterans Fun Run, AIDS Walk, and the 9-11 Flag Memorial. They also volunteered to help sponsor various Heritage Month events. Past programs and events EMCC has offered is Welcome Week, first Welcome Week, Finals Week of Champions, Student Appreciation Day, and our first ever Spirit Week. Over coffee, coffee talks over coffee and donuts, students are able to engage EMCC administrators such as presidents, VPs, and deans in regards to students' issues, ideas, and concerns. Summer Success Academy. The EMCC Summer Success Academy was launched in July 2016. The Academy provides the first year students with a jump start to their college experience. Through engaging and dynamic experiences, students learn how to successfully navigate college, the college environment. The Academy consists of five three-hour sessions held July and August every Thursday. The areas of focus include 
campus resources, communication skills, academy, I mean, academic success strategies, and leadership development. And I could vouch for that is because I was a student that actually participated in the first ever program and actually changed my life to help me become a better student today. Fitness and wellness, live well, be well, and learn well. Healthy habits are correlated with better academic performances, such as how it's associated with be well-being and academic success, physical activity, sleep wellness, healthy nutrition, stress resiliency, and avoiding substances. Wellness in the classroom, collaboration with faculty, infuses healthy habit goal setting into the regular assignment in academic classes, student community health screenings, nursing allied health collaboration, meaning free health screenings for, communi for community, faculty, and students on campus. Athletics, the 2017 EMCC Women's Cross Country Team was named to NGCAA Cross Country All Academic American Team. The team ranked ninth in the country with a 3.717 GPA. Upcoming campus events, Hamas Conference, Coffee Talk, Student Success Fair, Alternative Spring Break. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you guys want me to go more? <laughs> uh, turn spring break in March, Student Life will be collaborating with Service Learning to facilitate EMCC's third spring break, the Trez Rio Wetland. Instead of taking students to party or have a good time, we encourage them to clean up and um, clean up the environment around the Trez Rio's wetland. Uh, this concludes our presentation. Thank you for all your time. Thank you so much. Ms. Livingston. This is, yeah, this is for either of you, but as I heard all about the Summer Academy, quick question, what's the number one thing high school teachers can teach seniors to get ready for college, in your experience? Um, in my experience, uh, working with uh, high school teachers, I would say, really honestly, just tell them they should be themselves when they go to college, instead of trying to be something that they're not especially me being in a situation where I was always taught to be something I'm not. And then when I walked into college, it was more of be that student that you want to be, but at the same time, never lose sight, never lose focus out of the person that you want to be in college. So that's something I apply every single day, not just at school, but in life in general, too. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. We have won a Meredith Distinction Award this meeting. President Guerrero, would you like to introduce your honoree? Thank you. May I approach the, Please approach podium, the podium, President Hendricks? Thank you. <laughs> President Hendricks, members of the Governing Board, Chancellor Maria Harper Marinick, members of the Chancellor's Executive Council and guests. It is my pleasure this evening to introduce to you the man that you've all come to see, Dr. Tom Foster. Tom, would you join me at the podium, please? You have in uh, your information packets uh, a full detail of Dr. Foster's service to Maricopa. I would just like to highlight a few things for you and for the audience. And I'll start with the year 1969. That's an important year. I'll be coming back to that at the conclusion of my remarks. But that is the year that uh, Tom enrolled as a student at Mesa Community College. Uh, after taking several semesters of classes, his uh, student career was interrupted by service to the United States in the military as a member of the Army. Uh, he returned to graduate in 1976 from Mesa Community College went on to ASU where he would eventually earn three degrees, including a doctorate. He uh, has high school teaching in his background at Mountain View High School. He began as an adjunct in Maricopa in 1980. By 1997, he was an instructional designer for the Maricopa Advancing Technology, um, that's an affiliate of, uh, of Maricopa, Maytech. In uh, 1999, he came to Chandler Gilbert Community College teaching a learning community at our Williams campus. He spent several years as an instructional technologist at Chandler Gilbert and then went to the business faculty where he has taught 17 different courses over the years in his career, earning him the nickname PrEP, 
<laughs> or your prepness. <laughs> or El Preparino, if you're not into the whole brevity thing. He was also instrumental in the work that we've done throughout the years at Maricopa in finding our way with online learning and the development of our commitments to learning management systems such as Blackboard and Canvas. And uh, he is a member of three Innovation of the Year teams at Chandler Gilbert. He served for two years as the Business and Computing Studies Division Chair at Chandler Gilbert prior to his retirement. And he now, as a retiree, has time to pursue his real career. And it's a great privilege uh, to share with you, going back to the year 1969, I didn't know Tom in 1969, but when I came to Maricopa and met him, I found out that we had something in common. We were both playing in rock and roll bands in 1969. <laughs> Crystal Wall, Haymarket Riot. <laughs> and so uh, as uh, we met, uh, we joined a rock band that he and I still play in today. And I know some of you uh, sitting in this room have been to see us. You can learn all those details on painkillermusic.com <laughs> or like us on Facebook at Painkiller Music. I now introduce to you Dr. Tom Foster. Thanks very much. I have just a few words. Thanks for coming out. President Hendricks, members of the governing board, Dr. Maria Harper Marinick, members of the CEC, guests and fellow faculty. First, thank you to Bill Guerrero, Dr. Bill Guerrero and Dr. Maria Harper Marinick for recommending this honor. I'm, I'm humbled to be here. I want to also thank my wife, Valerie, talented author and brilliant teacher, <laughs> for her support throughout my career. Without her, I wouldn't be here either. If I may take a few minutes, I wasn't ready for college when I enrolled in MCC in 1969. Um, I was playing in a band. Uh, <laughs> in fact, by the end of that academic year, I was in, on double secret probation. <laughs> After my military career, I came, came back and graduated with high distinction and a member of Phi Theta Kappa. While I was at MCC, I discovered my passion for this career in teaching which brings me here. This discovery came while sitting in classes at MCC. My professors Bill Holt, Dr. Les Swan, Ms. Barbara Ellsworth, Art Beals, and Mr. Doyle Burke, and others influenced me to become a teacher because of their passion, caring, and professionalism, and their recognition of my academic promise. Throughout my 37 years as a teacher at Mountain View High School, Rio Salado, Shout out to my former president, um, Chandler Gilbert. I always reflected on the lessons I learned from those early years from my professors. And as a result, my students benefited as well. The most important lesson was respect to students, respect the student. I look at the faculty members gathered here tonight <coughs> and see the skills, professionalism, and passion that they take to their classes every day. Mostly, I think about our students who like me in the early years, benefit from the examples received by enrolling in Maricopa. Finally, I leave you with one thought reflecting the summary of my experience as BSA, MAT, adjunct, right, faculty, uh, and the student. My last class was last semester, so that's 48 years of being a student at Maricopa. Um, I leave you with these words. We show respect for students through respect through faculty. Thank you very much. Okay, for the citizens' interim tonight, I'm going to divide it into a couple different sections. Uh, I will call on the speakers that are speaking about a topic on the agenda immediately before the board discusses that agenda item. Um, before I read the preface to Citizens Interim, I'd like to make a, just a few comments before we start this meeting, because I know there's a lot of emotion about some of the topics that are on the agenda tonight. Um, I, I would like to share when I was elected the chair of this board, 
One of my goals was to bring an increase in decorum and respect amongst the members and to the meetings. Uh, not to say that my predecessor didn't do an excellent job, but I wanted more decorum, I wanted more respect, and, and I wanted a professional appearance here. And we, we've worked very hard to get that, and my fellow board members have worked with me to develop that. It is critically important that the members of the board and everyone on the dais is respectful to each other's views just because we differ in views doesn't make either of us wrong. It's, it's critically important that those on the dais respect those in the audience and those that are speaking. It's critically important those in the audience are respectful to those on the dais. Part of what's prompted me to make these comments tonight before we get started is we had our meeting last week. I don't know how many of you were here at the meeting last week, but at the end of the meeting last week, I had several people come up to me. Uh, I presume they were faculty members. And they came to me and they said, you need to set aside your differences with Mike Mitchell. Just because the two of you don't like each other, you need to focus on the issues here. And as I was listening to them tell me I needed to set my personal feelings for Mr. Mitchell aside, I saw Mr. Mitchell going out the back door. And so I pulled away from them and I walked out to the, to the foyer there and I called to Mike on the steps. I'm sorry, Mr. Mitchell. And I said, Mike, and he turned and I said, are we good? And he came back up the stairs, we shook hands, and he says, yeah, I understand, you have your job, I have my job. The emails I've gotten this week that describe these personal feelings, I, I want to share with everyone, I have no personal feelings that are negative towards Mr. Mitchell. I've met with him a number of times, I don't know him well, but from what I do know him, I like him. I, he and I could easily be friends. We are perhaps on different sides of some issues. But anyone who thinks that decisions up here are made on a personal basis, that any board member decides I dislike someone or I don't respect someone, you are tremendously misled. You, you have no concept of what goes on up here. No one up here is making any decisions on a personal basis of who they like or who they don't like. Everyone here, just like people on the other side of these microphones tonight, they'll be speaking to us. They're here because they believe in something. And regardless how a vote goes on any issue, it doesn't make either side wrong or foolish. Or uh, I, I got one email somebody sent me and they, they indicated that the chair on this board wasn't qualified to run a one-stall pay toilet. And that may well be correct, I, I don't know. But to personalize an argument like that, uh, it, it's, it's unfortunate, and I would hope the people in this room are professional enough to, to realize we're, we're all here to do a job. And if we, if we don't agree on everything, it doesn't mean it's one side against the other. We can all work together for the good of Maricopa. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and read the uh, preface to the uh, First Citizens Interim, and we will start with speakers that are not speaking on an agenda topic tonight. Um, the Citizens Interim is an opportunity for members of the public to address the Governing Board. In compliance with the Open Meeting Law, the Governing Board will neither discuss nor take action on issues raised during this portion of the agenda. When necessary, issues will be taken under advisement and placed on subsequent agenda. Presenting concerns to the Board and the free expression of ideas should be communicated with decorum and respect. Uncivil or disorderly conduct is not permitted. The use of derisive or insulting language or the direction of remarks that defame, attack, or harass an individual may serve as cause for the board's chair to direct that the speaker immediately conclude his or her remarks. With that, our first speaker tonight is Doug Madosky, speaking about football. President Hendricks, members of the board, Dr. Harper Marinick, members of the CEC, and guests, my name is Douglas Mandosky, and I am the district athletic specialist representative for the athletic specialist employee group and the head football coach at Scottsdale Community College. I am here today to represent the football coaches of this district, and more importantly, the several hundred current and future students that are impacted by the decision to eliminate football throughout this district. In Maricopa, we frequently use learning outcomes to justify decisions. In this case, the outcome does not add up to the decision. My goal for today is simply to make the governing board aware that this decision serves as an endorsement in the elimination of student opportunities for a population of students dominated by minorities. 
The Maricopa Priorities Task Force report on athletics may serve may just as well be deemed the second political dossier of 2018 as it was commissioned solely to justify the elimination of athletics regardless of fact. This was accomplished through collusion between members of the committee that were both biased and compromised to deliver a predetermined outcome. Nearly half of the committee was comprised of members that have historically written papers or made statements to faculty senate groups of their individual disdain for athletics within the community college system. One of which was handpicked despite documented <laughs> unanimous DAC objections. This particular individual was relieved of his duties as an athletic director after a lengthy human resources investigation determined that he had created a hostile working environment while serving as an athletic director at one of the Maricopa schools. It is the position of those representing the football student population that the decision and subsequent announcement to eliminate football was done in such a manner to both blindside students and to create the most damage possible for students. The decision was made after the winter recess precluding several student athletes with scholarship opportunities from taking them as they believed that returning to Maricopa schools was in their best interest but now find themselves absent of coaches directly relied upon for personal growth. Furthermore, this decision fell just after the class refund date for many of our students so that they were not able to recoup the financial investments that they had made in their educational experience should they have desired to transfer to another institution. Additionally, the decision came two days from National Letter of Intent Signing Day, leaving many prospective in-county students with no options as they had already through the recruitment process passed up on various scholarship opportunities. No part of the timeline of this decision was about what we profess to be our number one priority in Maricopa the students, which is simply shameful. As coaches, parents, students, and prospective students, we have struggled to understand this decision and how it was reached. In October, the Chancellor stated that we would review athletics and football after the 2018 season, leaving each of us to believe that we too would have an opportunity to address concerns of this district as other athletic teams are being provided. In reviewing what little information we have surmised of this process, numerous narratives and numbers have been recklessly thrown about, which simply does not make this conversation any less of a black eye for the district. Information that has come out has been untrue or at the very least misleading. For instance, the district has stated there is a $23 million capital improvement needed in regards to the stadiums of the schools. Yet the report issued from the task force estimates a total of $5.2 million for all athletic venues rather than football in the district through 2020. This includes two schools that do not offer football opportunities for students. To date, there is yet to be a quote to verify any of these expenditures and the missing or misreported nearly $18 million simply cannot be overlooked. Simply stating that the outcome does not justify the decision. Additionally, student success metrics have been mentioned. The district themselves stated football players are not concerned with going to school or getting an education, when just the opposite is true. In published data from Scottsdale Community College in a cohort that spanned from 2010 to 13, the SEC football team outpassed the overall success rate of the campus as a whole by nearly 30%. Your time is up. You're going to need to wrap up quickly. Okay. And well, I'm well a place the district. Again, the outcome does not justify the decision. Finally, while I understand the importance of funding and how funding reductions in state budgets and county property tax have had an adverse effect on Maricopa. Not one person I've spoken to personally is ignorant of this fact. It is alarming, however, that football is categorized as unprofitable throughout Maricopa. I personally went through and calculated every student from the summer of 17, fall of 17, and this spring to calculate tuition paid, courses fee paid, and FTSE numbers. I eliminated any non-credit courses as I recognized that they can be inflated in a biased perspective. In doing this, I found that Scottsdale Community College alone made $305,979 in tuition and fees and $591,429, all inclusive, including FTSE. Additionally, the program accounted for 190.3 of FTSE throughout the district. Certainly, the outcome does not justify the decision. It is my opinion that misleading and frivolous statements do little to grow public confidence in the district and serve to undermine the integrity of the Maricopa Community College District as a whole. It is concerning to me that the most honest and transparent people involved in this decision also happen to be the most compromised people involved in it. The three biased members that were a part of the task force... We have another speaker. We have three minutes per speaker. I'm going to need you to wrap up right now. Okay. I am hopeful that at your urging, we as stakeholders can have the opportunity to further discuss, to present real information, solutions as to avoid any further embarrassment for the district, and to find a way that the outcome can justify the decision. With that being said, I yield, yield the floor, Mr. President, and look forward to any further remarks. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Our next speaker is Mr. Joseph Kirstein. Thank you, President Hendricks, Chancellor Harper Marinick, CEC, and board members and guests. Uh, I'm a former football coach in this district, uh, 21 years at Glendale Community College. Um, I want to first start by quoting someone who had a huge impact on my life. His name was John Wooden. Wooden promoted the idea of a teacher coach. Wooden said that as a coach, you teach sports. However, according to Wooden, a coach has to be more concerned about the overall learning than just the sport or just winning the game. 
Wooden said it can be done in a way that's also helping them develop in other ways that will be meaningful forever. It's about building habits and practices that support students for life. This fall, we're going to have the 30th reunion of uh, our first national championship team of 1988. And when I shared the information about the elimination of football with many of those young men when they already knew it before I ever shared it. Uh, they were really devastated about the, about the decision. Um, one of my former players said, Coach, they don't understand ROI. I said, well, Kevin, what, what's ROI? He said, return on investment. He says, if it wouldn't have been for Glendale football, and Glendale Community College, I never would have accomplished the things that I have. And I don't, I don't say this to brag about myself, but I consistently hear that feedback from these young men that typically come to Americopa Community College um, to play football, quite frankly. Uh, they're very driven and People like Doug Madowski and the other coaches in the district and, and what I tried to do when I was coaching is take that drive, that innate drive that an athlete has and guide it and direct it and shape it so that they become better students, they become better people. They go on to have outstanding careers and can uh, be an asset to their community and their families. Um, we're frustrated, you could tell by Doug's talk. Um, we just want an open, transparent, uh, letting out of, of the information. There's so many inconsistencies. You know, the one he mentioned about capital um, investments. It said in there that Glendale's supposed to projected from the task force 1.43 million for capital investment. And then someplace else it says it's gonna take 23 million to improve our stadium. <laughs> Those numbers are way off. How can they be so far off? So that's where we're, our frustration is. And we know as, uh, we're bringing big numbers into the college. Uh, in terms of enrollment, and, and why would you threaten that? I, I don't understand. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Joe Springer. Hi, Mr. Uh, or President Hendricks, uh, Dr. Harper Marinick, uh, members of the CEC, um, let's see, uh, members of the board and guests. Uh, my name is uh, Joe Springer. I'm a faculty member over at Glendale Community College. Been there since 2002. And what I want to talk about tonight briefly is just uh, some of your concerns last week about, uh, I believe it was called needless fear mongering. Um, there were a lot of people here last week. Um, and some would say uh, justifi justifiably worried about things. And I want to say it's not so needless, the concerns that people have. And I need to uh, maybe use an analogy here um, you know, about what's going on. And my analogy would be, uh, say I came from the government, say I was a government official and I said, you know that First and Second Amendment? They were written back in the 1700s. Maybe they're a little bit outdated. Maybe we should replace them with something else. I don't know what we'll replace them with, because I haven't thought that far ahead about it. Um, but trust me, you guys will still have all of those freedoms that are enumerated in those amendments. If a government official came up to you and said that, would you trust them? I'm going to guess the answer is probably be no. In fact, in general, if someone comes up to you and says, trust me, that's usually kind of a danger signal there. Um, but that's what I was hearing last week was, we're going to be removing meet and confer, um, getting rid of some of that faculty governance, but trust us, nothing's bad's going to happen. Um, 
I'm an Arizonan. I'm also a lifelong libertarian. It's, and you will understand it's kind of hard for me to trust a governing official when they say, trust me. It's just kind of in my blood there. Um, so I'd like to have some verification. I don't see any reason why we should get rid of meet and confer. I don't see any reason why we should get rid of faculty governance. They are good things. I like meeting. I like conferring. I think faculty <laughs> governance is good. Um, and not only that, I got 27 pages of uh, data that says that, that school districts that actually embrace faculty governance and collective bargaining, the students will actually see improvements sometimes in SAT scores. It's kind of older data, but I know this is backed up by about eight or nine peer-reviewed sources. Um, so I can leave that if you guys wanted to see that. But I just want to say uh, that I don't see uh, why we should be going this fast on this issue. Um, this seems like a uh, kind of a large government solution to a problem that does not exist. And the uh, concerns the faculty have are real. This is a great district. It is nationally recognized as being a great district. It's because of the hard work of our faculty and even harder work of our students. Um, so I just wanted to say that, and I'd like to hear some more information about why meet and confer should actually go away. But thank you very much for the opportunity to talk. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next speaker, Colleen Gronke. Am I pronouncing that anywhere near correct? <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> okay. President, Mr. Hendricks, members of the board, Dr. Harper Mayer Nix, members of the CEC and guests. My name is Colleen Granke and I'm a student at uh, Glendale Community College. And um, I've got some concerns as a student, um, valid concerns. Uh, rumor is going around that uh, you guys will be dismantling or abolishing faculty contracts as they currently are. And um, well, that kind of makes me worry because um, not to discount your adjunct faculty, because I have had both, um, I just want to say that there's a huge difference between faculty and residential faculty. Um, you mentioned that we all have a job to do. Earlier you mentioned that, Mr. President. Well, from what I've seen between having faculty, uh, faculty residents, uh, residential faculty, sorry, and adjunct faculty, they don't look, your, your, your residential faculty doesn't look at it as a job. It's their livelihood. It is their livelihood to teach there. And they're available to the students and your adjunct faculty are not available to the students for the help that they need or the concepts that they need to learn if they're struggling with them. Does that make, sense, make any sense? I, I don't know. And by you abolishing these contracts, you are literally making it so their job security is being taken away. Their benefits will be taken away. And therefore, when you do things like this, you're lessening the quality of your staff. It's really important and should be important to all of you to have a binding agreement, a binding agreement, knowing that you're, you're gonna have a job the next year, knowing if you're going to have a job the following year, and it's going to be at this and that term, in, in those terms. And uh, I, I just, I think it's horrible to treat your, your wonderful staff this way. Uh, they, they, they need job security. They need job security. And let me tell you what, um, I, I have my home is two and a half hours away from here in Williams, Arizona. I come down here eight months out of the year just to attend your school because that's how much your faculty believes in your students and helps us students be successful. Adjunct, there are some great, great adjunct professors out there. However, we're not their priority. We're kind of like a second job for them. With full-time residential staff, they're available for their students, and they're available to better that institution. Thank you for your time. Just please revisit this. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lorena Austin.
Good evening, President Hendricks, members of the board, Chancellor Harper Marinick, CEC, and guests. My name is Lorena Austin. I'm student body president at Mesa Community College. Um, I'm here today per to present a student senate resolution that was passed uh, earlier today. And before I get to the, read the resolution, um, I would like um, you all to know that we have over 500 signatures from students throughout Maricopa Community College District in support of our faculty um, and staff who are the backbone of this um, great institution and they have changed our lives all for the better. Um, if we had more time, I'm sure we, between classes and work that we have to do as students to collect some of these signatures, there would be upwards in thousands, I assure you. Um, so I will get to this resolution while I have time. And it reads, uh, this is a resolution in support of Maricopa Community College District faculty. Whereas a proposed resolution from the Maricopa Community College District Governing Board was released on February 20th, 2018, which proposes the dismantling of faculty rights to actively participate in development of policies directly affecting accountability, organizational operations, and the terms of their employment, and whereas the Associated Students of Mesa Community College, or ASMCC, recognize that the active participation of the faculty in developing policies that affect accountability and organizational operations is essential to the functioning of an educational institution, and whereas the ASMCC further recognizes that the active participation of the faculty in developing policies that relate to the terms of their employment and professional activity is essential to recruiting and retaining high quality faculty, and whereas the ASMCC further recognizes that a well-functioning educational institution with high quality faculty is in the best interest of the students and whereas express support from the student governments of Scottsdale Community College, Phoenix College, Estrella Mount Community College, South Mount Community College, Paradise Valley Community College, and Chandler Gilbert Community College have joined in this resolution. Therefore, be it resolved that the Associated Students of Mesa Community College and the colleges listed above respectfully urge the Maricopa Community College District Governing Board to reject the proposal to dismantle the existing meet and confer system and eliminate faculty rights to participate in policy development. We encourage the Governing Board to ensure students receive the highest quality of education possible and to recognize that quality education requires that faculty and staff be active participants in all aspects of policy development that directly affect them and govern the educational function of this institution. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker, Felicia Ramirez. President Hendricks, members of the board, Dr. Maria Harper Marinick, and members of the CEC, guests, fellow faculty, colleagues, and students. My name is Felicia Ramirez. Uh, I am proud to be a member of PVCC Communication and Humanities Division faculty. Teaching is my vocation. I also have the distinct privilege of being an alumni from Glendale Community College class of 2001. So I'm very proud of my fellow students speaking up here today in solidarity with faculty members. I am here tonight to express my outrage at the decision to change the RFP and to remove the meet and confer process. I'm here to ask you to show your support for teachers by not doing so tonight, by not changing the RFP and by not removing meet and confer. I'm deeply concerned that you as governing board members are so distant and remote from the employees who work in this district that you can so easily and without regard to our personal well-being make decisions that create a negative working environment that detract from the strength of our district and that distract us from the very essence and purpose of our existence which is learning. It has been very challenging the past two weeks to focus on learning in the classroom because as one colleague put it, we have a piano hanging over our heads. As I work with students, this governing board meeting tonight has been in the back of my mind. This morning, my mom gave me a gift, a ceramic bird bath, and I was really excited about it. And I picked it up to put it in the perfect spot and it broke all over on the floor. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's an omen. <laughs> <laughs> 
And uh, I know that uh, you have mentioned that we have no reason to fear. And I think that's a very unfair comment. Critical thinkers try to think and feel as other people do. So in an attempt to be empathic and understand what we're going through, I think you should try to imagine being in our shoes and the kind of uncertainty that your decision to take these actions on tonight is creating. As a student of the system and as a student uh, with family members who have attended Maricopa Community Colleges, my husband, my sister, my brother-in-laws, my sister-in-laws, we are all been students of Maricopa Community Colleges and we believe that these colleges help promote social justice. So in my disappointment with the board tonight that what you're seeking to do is engage in an undemocratic process by removing meet and confer and creating an unjust system that is unfair for faculty. And I ask and strongly encourage you to please reconsider. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Annalise Harper. President Hendricks, members of the board, Dr. Harper Marinick, members of the CEC and guests. My name is Annalisa Harper. I teach communication at Scottsdale Community College. I was hired to teach intercultural communication. When I was hired, I had a PhD and I was a returned Peace Corps volunteer. Puedo hablar un poco de español. Since then, I participated in the early exchange programs that Maricopa offered the faculty, back when the board loved the faculty, worked with the faculty, and invested in the faculty. They worked with us together for the benefit of our students, so that our students can have a teacher like me today. I've been to China, I've been to the Netherlands, I've been to Turkey, and I did that with the support of this college system. I've also served um, a Fulbright to India and a Fulbright to South Africa. When I start talking to my students on the first day of class and I offer my credibility, my students sit in awe because they're like, wow, this is a community college and look who I have talking to me today. And I live up to their expectations every single day. I'm here because of the RFP and I'm not stupid enough to think that if you remove the, the meet and confer clause from the RFP, that the RFP will continue to stand and that you'll be able to continue to attract confident, passionate, qualified individuals who change people's lives. Every single day we are in the classroom. I offer ideas they've never heard before. I need the RFP and the security so that I can continue to offer ideas that not everybody agrees with, but that as educators, we have to offer those ideas so that the minds, once stretched, never return to the original size. That's the goal of education. That goal rests on the RFP. I am a product of the RFP. Hundreds of people attending this meeting are a product of the RFP. We are here because we are qualified, because we care, because it's important to us, and because our students are of the utmost importance. And we can't relax in a classroom and be at our best if we are not protected in the job that we were hired to do. I'll end early for you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sasha Rudisich. Am I close? <laughs> Sir, you had me at Sasha. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> President Hendricks, members of the board, Dr. Harper Marinick, members of the CEC and guests, my name is Sasha Radisic, and I'm the Faculty Senate President at Glendale Community College. No matter how good a driver you are, if you tear the seatbelts out of your car, it will make your passengers nervous. The RFP is the faculty's seatbelt. 
It is the contract that spells out all our protections as employees, and it created the environment that caused many of us to come here in the first place. While tonight's resolution will not harm anyone, it would revoke the document that protects us from harm. Even if no current board member or administrator acts on this, tearing out our seatbelts creates an environment where a future board or a future administrator could do so. That makes us nervous. We recognize that the RFP is a flawed document. It has rough spots and imperfections. However, it is the very best contract we have, and it shouldn't be abandoned until we have a replacement available that is superior. Perfect is the enemy of the good, and the RFP is a good document. I also want to speak about the faculty. You expect dedication from your faculty, and you should. But attracting and retaining excellent faculty requires a work environment where excellent faculty can thrive. The faculty care about the students. Without employment protections, we can't safely speak out about problems on the campus and in the classroom. The faculty care about education. Without academic freedom, we can't safely speak the truth about controversial issues in the classroom. And yes, the faculty care about job security. We have spouses and children and mortgages and car payments and bills. So unpredictable changes to our contract make it difficult to trust a career at Maricopa. The faculty here are dedicated to this place and they care very deeply about what is happening tonight. As proof, please remember that today is National Pancake Day. <laughs> Several hundred of us are attending this meeting rather than going to IHOP to eat a free short stack of pancakes. Ladies and gentlemen, if that's not dedication, I don't know what is. Thank you for your time. Just for the benefit of the board members, I had uh, indicated we'd have five speakers on each topic for three minutes each. Some of the speakers signed in indicating their topic was other. Um, at this point, we have some others that did sign in to speak on the topic of meet and confer. It uh, doesn't seem reasonable to penalize them when they did sign in and list their topic, so I'm going to continue with some additional speakers uh, because I've already called on the ones that did not list their topic. Our next speaker is Peter Lupin. President of the board, Mr. Hendricks, esteemed board members, Dr. Harper Maranek, members of the CEC, college presidents and guests. My name is Peter Lupu. I'm the chair of the Philosophy and Religious Studies, and Religious Studies Department at GCC, my home. GCC is my home. Is there anything else left to say to encourage you to do the right thing? I think so. Education is about persuasion. We are educators. When we enter into that classroom, we try to persuade our students that knowledge matters to them, to their life, that thinking matters to them. Meet and confer is about persuasion. It's not collective bargaining. It is shared governance. We don't have, in the meet and confer, any of the powers of unions in collective bargaining. We only have the power of persuasion. And when persuasion works, and people come together, and they manage to come up with a product, with the right process, and that product has deep roots. And this district needs deep roots to bring us all together. That's what the RFP is. And as Sasha said, it may be flawed. But there is a process, a process, not personalities. It's not about personalities. I second uh, the president of the board initial statement. It's not about personalities. It's about the process and the product. There is an alternative. 
I urge, no, <coughs> I beg you, task the chancellor to have a task force to do this. And if that task force agrees on something, that will be much stronger for everybody, rather than do it in a unilateral way. I think the faculty will appreciate it, and it will strengthen all of us. Let us remember, education is persuasion. Persuasion, when it works, it's always much better. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think I can get this last one right. Frank Wilson. <laughs> President Hendricks, members of the board, Dr. Harper Marinick, members of CEC and guests. My name is Dr. Frank Wilson. I am a Queen Creek resident, Air Force veteran, and small business owner. My wife and three of my children have grown personally as students of Maricopa Community Colleges. My wife's community college experience provided her a way to transition from being a full-time homemaker to becoming a owner of a highly successful school-based therapy business. Our family will forever be grateful for what the faculty and staff of the Maricopa Community Colleges have done for us. For the past 13 years, it has been my privilege to serve students in the community as mathematics faculty at Chandler Gilbert Community College. For seven of those years, I've been deeply involved with the meet and confer process. I served on the team for five years, including four years as, as co-chair of the team. For the last two years, I've been providing data analytics support to the team. As I reflect upon my 20 plus years in higher education, I can see that some of my greatest learning experiences have come through my participation in the problem solving process we call meet and confer. I have seen administrators and faculty set aside their biases and their job titles to tackle complex issues. Finding common ground when there are diverse interests is challenging, yet I've seen members of the meet and confer team step up to the challenge. I have watched the group work through conflict, find common ground, and innovate to craft solutions which serve Maricopa well. One of the things that has impressed me most about the team is the commitment to find the best solution, not just the quickest solution. By reaching out to constituent groups, including CEC, the VPAA Council, the faculty, and others, the team has sought to anticipate and address any unintended consequences of proposed solutions. This deliberative, thoughtful process has made implementation of approved solutions easier and more effective. As is the case with any process in Maricopa, there are things that can make the meet and confer process better. There are numerous strategies that could increase the effectiveness of our problem solving process. <laughs> Getting rid of the meet and confer, confer process itself is not one of them. I encourage the board to consider an alternative course of action. One, have board members identify what they perceive as specific problems with the current meet and confer process. Two, empower the meet and confer team to research those problems, develop a deep understanding of the underlying issues, and innovate in crafting proposed solutions to address those problems. Three, have the governing board, board vote to approve or disapprove the proposed solutions. This course of action is a win-win because it allows the governing board to assert its authority as the final decision maker. It preserves a spirit of collegiality, collaborative problem solving that extends far beyond the meet and confer process. And three, it supports the governing board's values of inclusiveness, innovation, responsibility, community, excellence, and stewardship. Your vote today will send a strong message. It is my hope it will be a message of inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. We will now proceed to discussion of non-consent item 10.1, changes to residential faculty policies manual. I will share with the audience comments that I shared as far as procedure with the board prior to our meeting. I have been contacted by a few members of the board indicating that they are considering amendments to this resolution. I've not seen the amendments nor discussed them with anyone. I don't know which members have them, but I'm going to begin on my far right with Mr. Bartning, and then we'll proceed to my immediate right, then I'll go to my far left and come back to my left. Any amendments that anyone has, they can make the motion, hand it out to the members, we'll take a few minutes to read it, see if a second is available. If there is, we'll then discuss the motion for the amendment and then vote on it. 
That's not a good. Mr. Barney. We need a motion. Yeah, move the, move okay. The I'm told we need a motion on the original resolution first. Since I'm the one that brought it forward, I will motion to approve the original resolution. If I can get a second, and then we'll move to amendments. Second. We have a second. We'll now move to potential amendments. Mr. Bartning, do you have a proposed amendment? Thank you, President Hendricks. Uh, I do have a proposed amendment as well as a substitute resolution. Do you want me to just pass? Should we come with the amendment first? first? Let's take the amendment first. Okay. Mr. Barning, do you want to read your resolution and maybe explain it as you go through? I'm, I'm frankly having trouble understanding where the wording's being changed at exactly. Sure. Thank you, President Hendricks. Uh, the amendment is changing the uh, resolution where it says the process of meet and confer as defined in section 1.2 is terminated effective February 27th and replacing that with to be amended as follows. The section that is included there is actually the, uh, the current definition in the RFP with the exception of the part that is in bold italics, which is changing that language from with respect to responsibilities, wages, governance, benefits, and all other terms and conditions of residential faculty employment Two, with respect to responsibilities, governance, and other terms and conditions of residential faculty employment, with the exception of wages, compensation, and benefits. It then says in definition of meet and confer, the process is detailed in section 7.6. So the next section there addresses 7.6, because that would be contradicting that language in 7.6.1. And the only change there is the last uh, sentence, which as of right now, it says issues may include but are not limited to uh, working conditions, compensation, and benefits. It now states issues may include working conditions, issues may not include wages, compensation, and benefits. The final part of the amendment is just changing the effective date that you currently have in your resolution from November 1st to January 1st. Mr. Barding, if you could move your amendment. I, I'm sorry, make a motion for your yes, amendment? Yes, I, I move that we uh, discuss the amendment. Move that we adopt the Bartoning Amendment. I move that we adopt the Bar Bartoning Amendment. Is there a second? Mr. Sarr, are you making a second? We have a second. Mr. Bartoning, do you want to explain or make comments on your proposed amendment? Yes, I do. So I, I'm on, right? I'm obviously the, the new guy on this, on this board. This is my uh, 29th day in my first company board meeting. And 
I'm, I'm looking here at a, a, a RFP that is about 100 pages long that I've been trying to synthesize in the couple of weeks uh, that I've had to review this. Uh, I've had a number of emails and conversations with, uh, with faculty and administration. And in my limited knowledge of this wonderful system, I think, we have here at Maricopa Community Colleges, it seems to me as though uh, the element of the meeting and confer process that has been discussed and in terms of creating inefficiencies has to do with the wages, compensation, and benefits as opposed to what we have in the current resolution, which includes accountability, organizational operations, which seems pretty extensive. My amendments, uh, and I actually do have a, uh, a substitute resolution which encompasses this and a few other items, but I wanted to begin with, with something smaller, uh, is to address that specifically uh, and see if we can come up with, uh, with a compromise here before we uh, throw out the entire uh, process and not give uh, faculty a, a way at least to do anything here in the, in the time that we would replace uh, the meet and confer process per the current resolution. Do we have additional comments from the board? Mr. Saar. Regarding the amendment, I, I, I second it because there are parts of it that I think are, are good. Um, the bulk of the RFP, including meet and confer, I think have served us well for a lot of years. I don't necessarily want to throw it out. But I do realize, as many people have said, it's an old document and things change. Um, our students today are different than they were 50 years ago when this document started. So I think it is important that we have a, uh, a conversation about this document on a fairly regular basis and faculty obviously needs to be involved. Whether or not uh, the items of compensation, salaries, and so forth are included in work in, in the meet and confer process, it, it has been, but quite frankly, uh, uh, revenue and the budget determine whether or not those issues um, are actually part of the discussion in the end. I can't imagine uh, a discussion with, with an employee group that doesn't involve some of those issues at some point. But the realities of, uh, of what has happened in the past eight years that I've been involved, um, they've been secondary to some of the other in, in improvements in this document. So I'm, I'm open to the discussion tonight. I don't know that this is the final uh, passage uh, that you know, I, I give um, our newest board member credit for having to go first. Um, <laughs> but I look forward to the discussion from all board members, and I think this is a good start. So thank you very much. Dr. Thor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hendricks. I, I want to be sure that I understand your intent, Mr. Bartonin. Uh, it looks to me that your intent is not to terminate, meet, and confer and the residential faculty policies, but rather to limit the scope of meet and confer and the scope of those policies? I would say specifically to limiting the scope of meet and confer with relation okay. to those so three topics. By... Uh, suggesting changes to the definition of meet and confer and the process of meet and confer, are you suggesting that the parts of the resolution that numbers one and two that eliminate the process and call for the chancellor to present new faculty policies is no longer part of the motion? Well, again, I, I started here with a smaller Amendment. I'd be happy if President Hendricks allows to to give to the uh, other board members the substitute resolution that goes into further explanation. But I defer to the process. Is that a yes or a no? Can you can you answer all the amendments first? Mr. Barting, if you want to withdraw your amendment, you can offer your substitute motion. Okay. 
<laughs> or we can vote on your amendment and you can offer the substitution later. Uh, I, I think for, so we don't get too confused, I, I will uh, offer the resolution because I, I think in order to answer Dr. Thor's question, there's some other items in the resolution that would be contradictory to the proposed amendment. Uh, again, I'm new to this process, and so I created an amendment just to give the intention since that, that is what we were going to start with. So the Bartoning Amendment is withdrawn? I withdraw the Bartoning Amendment. And now you wish to introduce a substitute motion, is that correct? Yes. Okay, if you could distribute that. So I move that we discuss the Bartoning Substitute Resolution. We move that we approve the Bartoning Substitute Resolution. I move that we approve the Bartoning Substitute Resolution. Thank you. Let's read it and see if we have a second. President Hendricks, would you like me to? Wait, wait. Give us just a minute. Okay. Are we ready to move forward? Do we have a second? Second. Mr. Sarf seconds it. Mr. Bartning, if you want to explain your resolution. Thank you, President Hendricks. So everything in this resolution I, I've uh, underlined and italicized for what is being changed from your original resolution. The, the first part in the whereas section, whereas the governing board recognizes the valuable contribution that faculty can provide in the development of policies that pertain to the residential faculty's essential mission of teaching and learning. That is taken verbatim from your resolution from down in section two. I just uh, moved that to the top because it seemed to me more appropriate as a whereas clause as it didn't seem to pertain as much to the creation of a process of faculty policy development. The, the next change is the residential faculty policies manual dated July 1st, is extended beyond its termination date of June 30th to October 31st. I changed that to December 31st, uh, per some discussion of the last meeting of concern that it would be in the middle of the semester. The next section I've already discussed in the amendment, but I guess I'm, I'm starting over, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so there again, it refers to the process of meet and confer as defined in section 1.2, is to be amended as follows effective February 27, 2018. And again, that change in the meet and confer definition is with respect to responsibilities, governance, and other terms and conditions of residential faculty employment with the exception of wages, compensation, and benefits. Moving forward as the process is detailed in section 7.6, that is to be amended as follows. Issues may include working conditions. Issues may not include wages, compensation, and benefits. Moving beyond that, as there has been discussion ex expressed about the amount of time that is consumed for this process, uh, that change is, is simply changing it from a minimum of twice a month to a minimum of once a month from September to April. Uh, as the next line says, this schedule may be modified upon mutual consent of the team members, which seems as though they have the power to already change that anyway. Uh, the next paragraph, is the same paragraph that you have in relation to the chancellor. The only thing I changed in that paragraph is that it may become effective uh, January 1st, 2019 versus November 1st, 2018. Below that, 
where it says elimination of the process of meeting confer, the language just follows in accordance with the amendment of the meeting confer process as defined above in the current residential faculty policies manual. Number two speaks to a creation of a new process of faculty policy development related to wages, compensation, and benefits that recognizes the governing board as the final approval authority, and that would be uh, directed by the chancellor, uh, again, per your original resolution language. And the last item simply states an a date and effect, because I don't see that on this current resolution, stating that the new RFP shall be in, fact, in effect from January 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2020. Thank you. Do we have questions and comments from the board? Sure. Mr. Sarr. Um, good job, first of all, for a, a newbie on this board. I want to keep saying that. Um, I always want to make one recommendation, that this not be an RFP, that this be an agreement, which would change it to an RFA. I've said that for eight years, and I'll continue to say that until I die. But having said that, um, yeah, I, I think they make, some good, they make some good points in here. My only concern is the length of time that we're going to be giving uh, this group uh, to work on this because, you know, eight years of experience here shows that if you're going to give somebody a time, they're going to use it all. And my feeling is that uh, we have some pretty intelligent people that we're going to work on this. And to take the amount of time that you're talking about here just seems to be way over uh, necessary. I would rather see uh, a group get together for an entire day and, um, and, and not have to relearn what you talked about the last time before you come back to discussion again. So um, I don't know what the board would agree on for a time frame or what uh, actually the faculty would agree on for a time frame, but I just think we can do a better job than this of meeting for uh, um, all the time that's been given in this. I think it's imperative that um, the group that is put together on this um, get her done. Any further comments or questions from the board? I just want to understand what the next steps are here. Are you entertaining amendments from everyone before there's a vote? We, or are we, we would vote on the substitution and then we'll go through the rest of the amendments. Uh, 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 Mr. President and members of the board, if the substitute amendment is adopted, that essentially becomes the amendment on the table, and it can still be amended further, but the amendments would be to the, um, to the uh, one that was to the substitute amendment being offered. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially, if this substitute amendment is offered, then the original one, the yellow piece of paper, essentially goes away. And we are on the substitute, the, the substitute amendment becomes the, the, resolution. the resolution under consideration. Good. So our next step would be to vote on the substitute amendment, or substitute resolution. If it's approved, that becomes the resolution, and further amendments would be to the substitute resolution. Good. Does that make sense? Yes. So Any a yes comments? vote does not mean uh, that this is the final document. No, a yes, a vote, yes mean, vote means this is the one we're worked from going yeah, so forward. Yes, vote would mean the original okay. one is gone, and this is now the one we're working with. Any amendments would be to the new resolution. Okay. Mr. Barney, on this, uh, and I commend you for the job you've done. I was doing good if I could find my seat by the time I was here as long as you've been here. Um, is this something that you have belief that the presidential faculty supports? I have belief that uh, several faculty support this for conversations, uh, but I, I don't know for certain if uh, the president of the Faculty Associ Association does, okay. does support this. I guess my thought, if I understand this correctly, it essentially bifurcates the existing meet and confer policy it takes away, uh, I don't know what percentage, 80, 90 percent of what goes to meet and confer now would then go to a new process as described in the original resolution. And from what I can see, what would remain is discussions about working conditions would remain in meet and confer. But essentially anything involving wages, compensation, and benefits would defer to the new process that hasn't been set up yet that's described in the original resolution. Am I understanding that correctly, what the intent is? That's correct. 
Okay. I guess my comments on this is uh, I had floated the idea of bifurcating to a few people um, before. From the communications I've gotten, I haven't got anybody that said, could we, could we soften this? I've gotten emails that said, don't do it, and I've gotten emails that said, do it. Um, I guess I almost see this as a, this is a significant change we're proposing. People who support it, support it. People who don't, don't. But there's not a lot of middle ground. This is a major change we're making. This almost sounds like offering up a Band-Aid to pacify somebody. And I, I, again, I think we need to be respectful to people that agree and disagree. And I, I don't think that's what this is. I'm, I'm going to oppose it, but with all respect. Is there further comments? If not, we'll vote. I'm going to take a roll call vote on the substitute resolution. A yes vote will indicate that this is the resolution we are moving forward with to amend. A no vote will mean this resolution goes away and we're discussing the original resolution. Dr. Thor, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. Haber? No. Mr. Saar? Yes. Ms. McGrath? Nay. Mr. Bartley? Yes. Ms. Livingston? No. I vote no. The substitute motion fails by a vote of four to three. Mrs. McGrath, do you have any amendments or substitute motions? No, sir, I do not. Thank you. Mrs. Haver, do you have any amendments or substitute motions? No, I do not. Thank you. Mr. Saar, do you have any amendments or substitute motions? Well, first of all, I want to change the name from the uh, residential uh, faculty policy to residential faculty agreement. The only policies that we have in this district are board policies. This is an agreement, uh, not a policy. So I would make that amendment as my first. Uh, if you want to vote on that separately, I would acquiesce to that. It's up to you as to what amendment you're making. If you're making an amendment with more than one change, then it'll be one amendment if you want to make that amendment. I'll make that one first, and then I'll come back with a second amendment. So your amendment is, just so I understand correctly, you're going to change anywhere that it says residential faculty policy to say residential faculty agreement. That is my motion. Okay. Do we have a second? A second. We have a second. Is there any discussion? Ms. Livingston. Where, what would it that do for us? Going into a book and changing all the verbiage, how, how would that change that? Or is it just a stance that you have? Mr. President, may I respond? Mr. Zarr. Um, again, it, it, it's, it's been confusing for lots of reasons. An RFP in, in most industry is a request for proposal. We, we've always talked about that. Um, but more importantly, in this district, a policy comes from the board. Uh, the, 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 the chancellor and, and everything else is administrative regulations. That, that's in policy. That is our policy. So I'm simply saying let's be consistent in uh, how we label these things. And, and as far as changing, you know, I'm, I'm a techie guy, you, you get into word and you say automatically change anything that says policy to agreement and you've got this in, in place. Uh, I just think it's been a long time coming that we, we've talked about this, as faculty's talked about it, but it seems to get pushed aside. So I'm just pushing it to the front again. Any further comments? I'm just going to comment, this seems like an awful lot of work to change a phrase that's worked fine, I'm told, for 40 years. I'm not going to support it. If there's no other comments, we'll vote. Ms. Livingston, how do you vote? No. Mr. Barton? No. Ms. McGrath? Nay. Mrs. Haber? Nay. Dr. Thor? Yes. Mr. Saar? Yes. I'll vote no. The amendment fails. Mr. Sorry, you had a second amendment? Yes, in the original yellow document, um, I would just like to do, um, further define the makeup of this um, committee that the chancellor is to put together and the time frame in which they have to work. I, I agree with 
Dr. Barlow's, um, or Mr. Barlow's uh, points that in changing things in the middle of a semester. I think you mean uh, Mr. Bartney. Uh, what's that? I believe Bartney. you mean Mr. Bartney. I'm sorry. I'll get it yet. Um, th there's some reasons for, for better timing on this. So I would suggest that, uh, number one, the dates that uh, have been proposed uh, earlier uh, are included in, uh, into this yellow sheet and that the makeup of the committee that the chancellor is going to put together is limited to, um, uh, I'll say, uh, three members from the faculty and three members from the administration in the time frame that they're going to work on um, is um, the, what uh, has been proposed in the yellow document. Okay, just to be clear, when you say the dates previously proposed, we need to know what those dates were so we're clear on what the amendment is. Uh, okay. Um, what's that? He can make it verbally if he doesn't have it. Um, and one ahead is history. Um, changing uh, the residential faculty policy manual dated July 1st, 17 is extended beyond its termination date. Uh, I want to change that from June 30th, 2018 to December 31st, 2018. I also want to um, make it effective in the, in, under 7.6.2 to the effective date of January 1st, 2019. And that the uh, change added to that third area at the bottom of page of the yellow page uh, to the new residential faculty policy manual shall be in effect from January 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2020. Okay, is there any further discussion on the SAR amendment? I need a second first. Well, that's a good point. I mean, do we have a second? I second. Mr. Bartling makes a second. Do we have further discussion? We will go ahead and vote. Mr. Bartning, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. Livingston. I just want to make a comment before I share my vote. I, I fully understand that this is just giving more time, but I believe you stated earlier, if there's time to give, then people will just take it. And I feel this, this goes into the... I think this goes into this also. I, I don't see the purpose of, of changing the dates. I, I, I'll stand with the board, obviously, if you want to change dates, but you're not giving me a good reasoning for changing this. So with that, I vote no. Ms. Livingston votes no. Mrs. McGrath, how do you vote? Nay. Mrs. Haver, how do you vote? No. Mr. Sarr? Yes. Dr. Thor? Yes. I vote, I vote no, SAR amendment number two fails. Ms. Livingston, do you have any amendments or substitutions you'd like to offer? Yes, sir. Dr. Thor, do you have any amendments or substitutions you'd like to offer? I do. First, Mr. President, I'd like to explain myself. Dr. Thor, please proceed. I support the faculty. I support meet and confer. I support the residential faculty policies. However, given that I do not know how the vote is going to turn out on this resolution, I would like to offer these amendments, again, related to the date. Uh, as I commented last week at the meeting, to abruptly end meet and confer as of uh, February 27th and not convene a new process until July 1 leaves us in limbo. So at a minimum, we should extend meet and confer through June 30th of 2018 to allow for the development of a new process. Additionally, it makes no sense to me to change 
uh, faculty policies two-thirds of the way into a semester. So we're asking faculty to start classes in August under one set of working conditions and policies and then be prepared to change November 1. Uh, faculty are hired for an entire year and set forward their classes and syllabus for an entire year. So at a minimum, we should extend the existing residential faculty policies until June 30th, 2019, in order to allow for consistency throughout the next academic year and to uh, give the opportunity for the new process uh, to work uh, in a reasonable fashion. Thank you. So I, I move my proposed amendments. Do we have a second? Second. Mr. Sarr, are you seconding? Mr. Sarr seconds. Do we have comments or questions? I have a Ms. Livingston. I just want to thank you, Dr. Sor, um, for explaining why in the world you would change the dates. At least mm -hmm. now it has clarity. Thank you very much. Any further questions or comments? We will proceed with voting on the Thor Amendment. Mr. Saar, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Haver, how do you vote? No. Ms. McGrath? Nay. Mr. Martin? Yes. Ms. Livingston? I'll explain my vote. While Ms. it now has clarity, it is again still a Band-Aid. Um, we're here to decide on a policy. With that, I vote no. Livingston votes no. Dr. Thor? Yes. I vote no. The Thor Amendment fails by four no's, three ayes. Dr. Thor, do you have any further substitutions or amendments? Um, I would like to move for, to postpone this resolution indefinitely. Do we have a second? The motion fails for a lack of a second. Are you taking another? Can I make another motion? Oh. We will allow it, Mr. Bartney. I'd, I'd like to propose that we table this resolution to our next board meeting. Do we have a second for Mr. Partning's motion? Second. We have a second. Is there a discussion? Um, Seeing uh, none, I, 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 Mr. Saar. If I could. Um, I guess my question is what happens between now and the next meeting? Um, is, is there going to be further discussion uh, amongst uh, somebody and somebody, or are we just going to start over again uh, 30 days from now? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Saar, President Hendricks. Uh, I hope that there is a discussion. That's, that's the intention. And to President Hen Hendricks' uh, comment earlier about whether or not I have the support of the Faculty Association to my resolution and that I've not really been able to uh, have adequate conversations to do that, I'm proposing that we have 30 days so that we uh, could have more of a consensus building process in place uh, given that this has been a rather shortened timeline uh, understanding that I'm new to the process uh, but it seems as though this is kind of uh, from my understanding come into the the fray rather quickly uh, in terms of how usually uh, these processes will take any further comments or questions seeing none we will, we will vote on the Bartoning Amendment number three. <clears throat> Mr. Saar, how do you vote? If I could explain my vote, I, I just, uh, if there are more specifics about how, what was going to happen and who was going to be involved between now and 30 days from now, I, I, I get the discussion, but um, I, I see this as having the ability to um, to work if the right people are appointed to this group that's going to work on a new language for the uh, meet and confer, so I'll vote no. Mr. Saar votes no. 
Dr. Thor, how do you Yes. <coughs> Mrs. Haber? No. Ms. McGrath? Nay. Mr. Bartley? Yes. Ms. Livingston? No. Ms. Livingston votes no. I vote no. Bartling Amendment number three fails. I vote of five, nay, two, aye. <coughs> Those three. I'm going to pass my own amendment now to my own resolution. Okay, to move forward. Okay, I will read the clauses that uh, I propose adding in my amendment. The resolution would stay the same as the original resolution with these additions. In the whereas's, I've added whereas Arizona revised statute section 11410 prohibits employees of Maricopa County from engaging in fundraising activities for a political action committee while on duty. Whereas the governing board does not oppose labor organization membership of employees as such membership is their right and in no way affects their employment relationship, but the board as a public employer functioning under the provisions of ARS 151444 does not have legal authority to recognize a labor organization, a labor organization as the employee's agent for purposes of collective bargaining. At the bottom of the resolution, I added a I'd label it section two, but it would actually be a third point. The point is the elimination of all paid release time for any member of the faculty executive council and for any employee of Maricopa Community College District that currently participates in the meet and confer process to be effective February 27th, 2018. And the effective date I added because I didn't type it. I will motion to move that my own amendment be approved. Can I get a second? Second. Motion is seconded. We will open it for discussion. I will open the discussion of my own amendment by describing my <coughs> reasoning for the amendment. First of all, the Arizona Revised Statute that I refer to, ARS Section 11-410. I'd like to read that so the members of the board and the members of the public are aware of what it says. It says, a county shall not spend or use its resources, including the use or expenditure of monies, accounts, credit, facilities, vehicles, postage, telecommunications, computer hardware, and software, web pages, personnel, equipment, materials, buildings, or any other thing of value for the purpose of influencing the outcome of elections. From that, I'd like to read from a email that was distributed by the Faculty Association. I'm just going to read a few sections in it. Uh, as one paragraph reads, therefore, as chairperson of the Maricopa College's Faculty Association Political Action Committee, I'm announcing our plan to raise $500,000 by June 1st of this year to support candidates for the governing board who share our student-centered values of higher education. Skipping from that one, I'm reading from another email that was distributed. I'll read one paragraph from the email from a member of the Faculty Association. The paragraph reads, the board and the chancellor have unilaterally decided to do away with the residential faculty policies, quotation, RFP. This means they can revoke our tenure, dismantle our faculty association, quotation, our union, comma, and we no longer have shared governance. From these, it appears that the Faculty Association 
either inadvertently or truly believes themselves to be a union. Um, it wasn't a misstatement. It was quotations clarifying if anyone thought it was not a union. It specifically stated that it is a union. As such, I can't see that we can legally continue to pay representatives that are fundraising for the purpose of placing money into political action committees. It would be a violation of public policy. Therefore, my proposed amendment. I'll open for discussion or questions. Seeing none, we will proceed to vote on the Hendricks Amendment to the resolution. Dr. Thor, how do you vote? No. Mr. Saar? Nay. Mrs. Haber? Yes. Ms. McGrath? Yay. Mr. Bartney? Yes. Mr. Bartney votes yes. Ms. Livingston? Wait, which one was it? We're voting just... We're voting on the Hendricks Resolution. The I'm sorry, the Hendricks Amendment amendments. to the Resolution. All of them. Yeah. Yes. Ms. Livingston votes yes. I vote aye. The Hendricks Amendment to the resolution passes by a vote of five to two. Uh, we, President Hendricks? Yes, sir. Just, just one comment. Is that, is that the correct uh, spelling on item two? Looks like it is. Is that kind of no, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they'll figure that out when they make okay. the change, but we'll be fine there. We will now move to the original resolution as amended by the Hendricks Amendment. Can I get a motion? I, I will move my own amendment. I move that we approve the resolution described by item 10.1 amended by the Hendricks Amendment that we just approved. Second. Motion is seconded. We will open it for discussion of the resolution as amended. Mrs. Livingston. I received some emails that were interesting, and I, I'm not going to read them all. That would bore you. You know what you stated. But something that stuck with me throughout all the emails. In one email they stated, well, I'm not very intelligent. Well, I guess none of us are. And you don't know what you're talking about. Well, this person does. You see, I'm a teacher. And not only that, I taught in a district that had meet and confer. It didn't work. It didn't work at all. No one got anything different. There was nothing different to share. And you know what? We spent hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars on people just like yourselves getting release time to work on things that, quite frankly, were illegal on campus. Now, let me take you from one experience to another. I sat on another school board, Pure Unified, and the first two or three votes in, I was asked to share my story about Deer Valley and how meet and confer only lengthened our times for decision, caused us quite a bit of money as a district, but didn't do anything for the employees. Not one thing. It made us feel good, but it didn't do anything. Now, I've never belonged to a group a union-like -like group, and I say union, don't, don't shoot me, just a group. It's never been my philosophy. But I'm a teacher, and I understood what those in the group were fighting for. But guess what? They never got it. Either money wasn't there, conditions weren't there, the bigger picture wasn't there. And that's the truth. In Peoria, I sat there, and I looked, I, I had quite a conversation with those that were coming up and, and, and chatting about it. Different philosophy than here um, as ability to communicate with those in the audience. And with each speaker, I asked them what question. What do you think will change? Our doors in Peoria are open, and they are, 
and they are still t- they were and they are still today. What do you think will change? And the answer that came from a dais, which also came in your emails, is that we will have legal recourse. It was said at the dais at Peoria, and it was said in the emails to me, the many emails to me, legal recourse. I can't stand behind a policy that allows you one thing, to sue, to demand. You have the greatest job in the world. You get to get up every morning and teach. But I look out and I see long faces, sullen faces, and you look at us like we're villains. We need I suppose I walked into that. Okay, fair. Fair. This policy has been around for 40 years. Policy has been around for 40 years. From what I can tell, this faculty-centric, and very rightly so, faculty-centric group. It no longer works. We need to move forward. I haven't given my vote, nor is there anybody else right now. But we have to look beyond your safety, security, or legal rights. We have to look beyond that. And quite frankly, I read every email, every single email, and I could not find one area that it helps the students. Because if I could, my vote would not be the same as it is tonight. I saw security. I saw legal options. And I saw pay. I saw everything that doesn't deal with, with working with students. Nothing. This vote tonight is tough. But we're not villains. We do care. And I, for one, my heart breaks for you because you do see us on the other end as just a villain. Or your hero, whichever way we vote. Anyway, it's all good. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Do we have further comments from the board? Mr. Barton. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, President Hendricks. Process matters. I think that someone else mentioned that tonight. And my, my concern mostly with this resolution is, is the process that we've taken to, to get to this point. Uh, I, it, it seems like there are pretty valid reasons for why the board wants this process, and I haven't been privy to all of those uh, reasons as I'm uh, so new to the board, but I can only comment on the, the process that that I have uh, perceived here in the last week, which seems as though it's not uh, giving a chance for, for further discussion on this topic. Uh, for a, uh, a manual that has been in effect, as you said, for 40 years, and I understand that eliminating the meeting conferred process doesn't eliminate the RFP per se, uh, but it it doesn't seem as though it's been done with a substantive analysis, uh, and that's that's what concerns uh, me at this point. Uh, so I, I I think again my substitute resolution was attempting to address the. Uh, conversation around collective bargaining, even though that doesn't apply, it's not a, a union, uh, that particular discussion 
um, which is why I presented that. And I know that change is maybe necessary at a time, uh, and you know, 40 years maybe we've arrived at that point. It just seems as though we should respect the, the process and, and make sure that there, there is morale across the institution because I think ultimately the institution uh, will be impacted uh, by this and really if we can have every, every party on board with what we do and if we can't, at least we, we give it a process uh, to find out if we can't get there. Again, I don't know what's already been done, but it seems as though there's still uh, some time to try to try something and get some more consensus uh, since we seem to carry the power of, of changing this in any number of ways. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Barton. Do we have any further comments? Chancellor Harper Meredith, would you prefer to comment now or would you prefer to wait till after the vote? Are you asking me to make general comments or to I'm, comment on the resolution? I'm just thinking if you want to make any kind of comment, I'm guessing when this vote is done, whether it goes up or down, the majority of our audience is probably going to leave. If you want uh, to make comments, you might want to make I, them before we vote, but if thank you'd rather you. we I, vote first. I will do it right now. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hendricks and members of the board. Um, I'll, I'll be brief, and I will not comment on the resolution itself. I just want to remind all of us that faculty members play a critical role in helping this institution fulfill its mission of access and service to the community. If we don't have faculty, we wouldn't have students, and so there's no business. Faculty members, I want you to know that I'm speaking on behalf of the administration that we value and we respect you. I will continue, as I have done for many years, to work collaboratively with you to develop policies that will be fair in the best interest of our students and our system, and that recognize and reward faculty expertise and professionalism. I have said this before, maybe twice now, I will repeat myself. I've been around in the system for 26 years, and I believe I have proven in those 26 years that I'm a champion and an advocate for faculty and what I believe matters most to all of us, and that is our students, their success, excellence and innovation in teaching and learning, academic freedom, scholarly work, and collaboration. And I remain committed to those values. And while I will not give an opinion on the resolution because I will be out of place, Mr. Hendricks, I do hope that the governing board allows me the flexibility to put a process in place that will include timelines that will not be disruptive to the learning environment, because that is what would be best for this district. So I, I thank you for allowing me to make comments. Thank you, Chancellor. We will proceed with voting on the resolution pertaining to agenda item 10.1, as amended by the Hendricks Amendment. Dr. Thor, how do you vote? May I explain my vote? Yes, Dr. Thor, please do. The Maricopa Community Colleges are one of the premier college districts of this country, and it is our outstanding faculty that made us a premier district. What this board is about to do is shameful, and this is a very dark day in Maricopa history and very disrespectful of the outstanding professionals in front of us. I vote no. Mr. Saar, how do you vote? <coughs> Mr. Saar votes no. Mrs. Haber? I vote yes. Yes for Mrs. Haber. Mrs. McGrath? Yay. Mr. Bartney? No. Mr. Bartney votes no. Ms. Livingston? Yes. Ms. Livingston vote yes. I vote yes. The resolution passes by a vote of four to three as amended. <coughs> We take a recess. So we're going to take a five minute recess. We will reconvene at 8.30.
Okay, we will proceed to uh, agenda item number 11.1, .1, the AAEC lease. If I can get a motion for the item. Mr. Chair. Mr. Sarr. Did I miss the uh, consent agenda? Uh, we haven't come to the consent agenda yet. Uh, we've just skipped to item number 11. Okay. We need a motion for item number 11.1. I move that we adopt 11.1. And a second? I second. Okay. We have a few people that have signed up to speak on this. We've already moved it, but I'm going to go ahead and have the public input on this item. The first person, speak, first person speaking is John Mulhern. Uh, President Hendricks, Governing Board members, CEC, Chancellor Harper Marinick, and guests, my name is John Mulhern, and I'm the Director of Athletics at Mesa Community College. First, I want to say that I understand and respect the, the, the decision-making process, and I appreciate the opportunity to express my opinion. In my presentation on November 28, 2017, I informed the governing board members that the field in which the AAEC High School has been proposed to be located on was designa designated by the college at some point in time as a soccer field. The college paid for plans for the soccer field, which included grading and drainage, landscaping, sprinkler system layouts, etc. I also expressed to the governing board that as the director of athletics at the college, I can and will use this field when the commitment by the college is there to maintain the field properly for athletic participation. When I first became aware of the proposed AAEC high school project, I was sent a link to an article by the Phoenix Business Journal dated May 2017, in which the article included the construction costs of the high school, architectural renderings of the high school on the soccer field, the selected architect, and that the bidding list for the contractors would be narrowed down to three finalists. I did not see any indication in the article that this proposed project was contingent on MCCCD governing board approval. I was also in an MCC building committee meeting in which I am a committee member on November 20, 2017, and on a PowerPoint presentation regarding this project, it stated on the slide, governing board approval to move forward. Now in fairness, it does not say seeking governing board approval, nor does it say received governing board approval. From the conversation, it seemed to me to be implied that the project was approved. I truly thought that this project had been approved. When I was informed that it was not, that I, and I could exp express my opinion, I, I choose to do so. For your information, I might have to skip that. I was in the real estate development industry. I was a general contractor, and I was also in, involved in multiple development projects. As a general contractor in real estate development, if I took the web page article and the PowerPoint presentation, to me that meant this project was approved and all I would have, to have done is to success successfully accomplish the goal. What if the AAC lease is voted down by the governing board today like it was on November 28, 2017, with some of the same reasons as the culture at the college, direction of the college, highest and best use of the property, and the compatibility of the high school with the surrounding college assets, which include a $13 million performing arts center, tennis courts, and a practice and regulation size baseball field. I think if the AAC lease approved tonight, I believe that it will send a message that in theory, the approval process for a college or a commitment by the college to an outside entity could possibly take place in reverse order. I may be wrong in my interpretation of this issue 
as I, as I have explained. However, I feel that this project did not follow what could be considered a courteous review process, which can include community engagement and decision making, future property values, stakeholder conversations, impact of the college or the proposed use with other college assets, long-term college planning, urban college with valuable, we're at urban college with valuable land holdings, and of course governing board approval. We're gonna need you to conclude your comments. We need Perfect, to in everyone. closing, Arizona, Arizona State University, Grand Canyon University, Benedictine University at Mesa, and Ottawa University are investing millions and millions of dollars in their athletic programs. Thank you for your time, consideration, and review. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Dennis Gray. President Hendricks, members of the board, Dr. Hopper Marinick, and members of the CEC and guests, my name is Dennis Gray, and I'm a member of the leadership team of AEC Early College High Schools. <clears throat> For 21 years, AAEC and Maricopa have enjoyed an effective partnership that's matured and blossomed over the years into one that's nationally recognized. We have 1,600 students on five Maricopa-connected sites at South Mountain, Paradise Valley, Mesa Red Mountain, Estrella Mountain, and Mesa, with site demolition on our land at Mesa happening just last week. Campuses, campuses of varying sizes and demographics, but all working toward high levels of student growth and achievement. Programs similar in nature can be found nationwide, but what AEC and Maricopa have created is an exemplar because of the effective collaboration we've had at both at district, at campus, and at all kinds of departmental levels in both academics and operations. Our students are our best testimony of program success in thanking them for coming tonight and offering them um, an excused absence for the first couple of hours tomorrow morning if they need it. Dominique Castillo attends Estrella Mountain. He'll graduate this year with 40 credits and heading next year to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Jake Murphy at Paradise Valley will finish his high school with 82 college credits, two associate degrees, He's undecided where he's going to college, but as a national merit finalist, it's not a matter of if, it's only a matter of where. Emily Bonilla at Estrella Mountain will have 36 credits. Uh, she says the college opportunity has allowed her to focus on the future in a way she hadn't predicted when she entered high school. She's going to ASU. And McKenna Stilson, also from Estrella Mountain, will have an AA degree, 62 credits, going to ASU, and she's a first-generation student going to college. <laughs> Students such as them all attest to the opportunity that they've had by attending concurrent enrollment courses at their Maricopa campuses. Our partnership is one that has 23% of our graduates earning degrees by the time they graduate from high school. It pays a million, over a million dollars each year in Maricopa tuition. It is one that has allowed our students to earn almost 120,000 credits over the years. But much more than that, it not only provides opportunity to help students get ahead, it opens doors to college and futures that might otherwise remain closed. It truly helps young people on their journeys to college, career, and community success. In doing so, we believe it is something in which both AAEC and Maricopa can jointly take great pride. Thank you. Thanks, Item 11.1 .1 has been moved and seconded. We'll now open it for discussion by the board. Mr. Saar. I don't want anything to say to take away from the importance of our relationship between uh, all of our colleges and AECC. Um, it's an outstanding partnership and the students enjoy uh, both a, a great high school education along with us. But we've had this discussion uh, two months ago and, and the vote was in, uh, against uh, doing anything with the adjacent property and my conversations prior uh, since then have led me to believe that they had made adjustments to their 
um, plans and were able to build their school on the property currently or was operated by a car wash. So I'm not sure why this is back again. The same reasons that we voted against the last time, I'm assuming, still exist since nothing has changed in the in, in what's placed before us. I just think, um, uh, number one, if they are looking at a uh, potential um, equestrian or, or a stable area, we already have one on that campus that they would be welcome to use in my mind because it needs their help, quite frankly. It's within a nine iron shot of their campus. It is away from the arts facility because it's been there longer than the arts facility has been there. So I'm just uh, at a loss to see why this is back on the agenda. Dr. Thor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hendricks. Um, I want to uh, reiterate uh, that my concerns about this lease has nothing to do with uh, a AAEC as a partner with the Maricopa Community Colleges are the great job uh, that they're doing with students, but rather it's a stewardship issue for me. The board is being asked to enter into a 32-year lease with no inflationary increases to that lease. Uh, were we to have inflationary increases rather than the 2.9 million that the lease before us would bring in, the income to uh, the college would be 4.45 uh, million. Um, I uh, ask uh, Mr. Hibbs to do a little research for me. We currently have 26 leases um, that are five years or more. Uh, 22 of those leases have inflationary increases in them. Uh, the four that do not, one of them is AACC at uh, South Mountain. So uh, I'm concerned that we do not have consistency in the terms of these long-term leases. And so at a minimum, I would request that we either consider a board policy or an administrative regulation that requires that we have inflationary leases, uh, increases in leases that go for five years or more. Uh, just to make the, the, further make the point, a dollar in 2018, in 2050, when this lease expires, will be uh, $2.20. So we're not being good stewards of uh, our resources um, and guardians of the taxpayer's dollar by entering into a 32-year lease with no increases. Thank you, Dr. Thor. Ms. Livingston, did you have comments? I'm all for making sure that the taxpayer is saving we're saving the taxpayer dollar. Um, in this case, though, I will heed to it's OK to give them a break. Why? You just met their students. And there are four of them there. And I met I don't know how many at PVCC. This program is amazing. It also feeds into our program. Hence, we do get dollars from this. And we get better kids at the end of it. This is something that goes beyond a monetary, a monetary amount. We're, we're turning out or helping to turn out great kids with fantastic futures. And I don't care why this is up again. I voted yes last time. And I intend to give them a home at, at Mesa if the rest of the board will have it. It's a good program. We have longevity with them. And their techniques, along with ours, work. Thank you. Any further comments? Ms. Haber. Yeah, um, I've reconsidered um, partially because I visited an AACC. Oh, I'm sorry. I was wondering why you. What did I do wrong? Okay, thank you. Um, I, I visited an AAEC uh, in the Paradise Valley 
one, and I not only was impressed, but I heard great stories about the the um, Acragas and uh, Equine Charter School at South Mountain and wonderful stories, but that isn't all of it. A big part of this is we do make quite a bit of money, and it, I was, it was explained to me how uh, this is an, um, quite a reasonable a large sum of money that we would continue to receive for these kids in their concurrent enrollment classes. And I hate to have to say this, but it's very likely that tuition will go up as time goes on, along with inflation. And I, I'm inclined to believe that it'll all take care of it itself. And I think there is a way we can get out of it if it's really a, a disaster. And probably both the, um, the school and, and we would agree if it wasn't working out satisfactory. So I've, I've changed my mind. And I, I think it's, it's a good idea. And I'm very grateful for these schools, especially in low-income neighborhoods that are turning around the lives of children. Mrs. McGrath, did you have comments? I'd just like to say that uh, we don't need any increases in the rent as years go on because these students don't go just to high school as has just been explained to us. They contribute a great deal of tuition money to our campuses and that more than makes up the uh, loss of increases in the rent yearly and I'm strongly in favor of this school. Thank you, Ms. McGrath. Mr. Barton. Thank you, President Hendricks. Uh, I've been told I talk too close to the mic, so is this still okay? Is this better? Uh, I'm a strong proponent of, of dual enroll enrollment, which AAEC, as everyone has said, uh, seems to have been doing a good job now for uh, decades from what I understand. Uh, I do uh, hear Dr. Thor's concerns about the inconsistency, uh, and I believe that should be a conversation, again, in terms of uh, process that we are consistent, but it sounds like we've already made four exceptions. And, you know, given that uh, that AAC right now is already operating at five community colleges or four community colleges, from my understanding, uh, and that there will be uh, the additional money from tuition, I believe, uh, if the numbers are correct, 30% of uh, AAC students on average are graduating with associate degrees from. Uh, AAEC, I do think that that will compensate to some degree. Uh, my only other uh, comment, I think the gentleman who mentioned is, again, process, uh, how we typically go about this, as I, I don't know, just to make sure that there is community engagement and that we are uh, seeking the highest and best use. Uh, but at this point, it seems like this has been uh, vetted to some degree, and I'm not sure why it didn't pass in November. Uh, but it looks like a great thing for the Maricopa Community Colleges. Mr. Sarr. Just a point of fact, you heard tonight that they've already started construction on the piece of property adjacent to ours. So regardless of whether we give this property to them or not, the, the money for tuition is going to be there. Um, they're going to use this, based on my conversation, for uh, the stables. And again, I, I'm not opposed to anything that they do. I'm just opposed to where they're going to put it. We have land on that campus that is already a stable, less than uh, 100 yards away from their property. And yet we're going to commit to this property for 32 years. Then there is no way that uh, a lease can be broken unless both parties agree. And if they're going to invest money in this property with a stable, uh, chances are we're not going to be able to negotiate something nice with them. Uh, but keep in mind, we're not gaining anything or losing anything by uh, giving them this land. Um, we're going to get that tuition money regardless. They're already building the building on the adjacent property that they own. Just making a point. Thank you, Mr. Sorry. Mr. Barton, did you have further comments? No, I'm I mean, to raise your hand. I didn't. Know oh, I didn't. I didn't raise my hand. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll just make a couple of comments on the on the escalations. I agree with Dr. Thor. We should have a system in place to use for most leases, of some length. However, there's always going to be exceptions, and in this case, my understanding is something in the neighborhood of 75 percent of these students enroll in concurrent enrollment. 
and the enrollment will likely increase over time. I assume the tuition that we will gain over time will be very similar to what escalations would have been in the base lease. Um, the base lease price is a reasonable return on our investment and in addition to that, in a time of declining enrollment when we're doing everything we can to keep our campuses going, this is an opportunity to increase our enrollment and I would look at the enrollment that will climb as meeting those escalations. I, uh, as I listened to comments tonight, just a few months ago, we voted on a maker space. And one of the arguments when we voted on that was to support our college presidents is when they bring forward items that they feel would benefit their campus. At the time of the maker space, I voted for it, even though I oppose the maker space concept, but I voted for supporting the college president. The same reasoning should apply here if that is valid reasoning as it was presented at the meeting. We would support our college president unless we had strong reason to disagree with that and I don't have any reason to disagree with it. As far as using it for a soccer field, I think that's a valid argument, but we have an entire football stadium that will soon be vacant. Uh, so I, I think we have spaces that we could make do with that. Um, I, I'm going to support this, this resolution. Any further comments? And we will vote with a roll call vote once again. Uh, Mr. Bartning? Yes. Ms. Livingston? Yes. Ms. McGrath? Aye. Mrs. Haber? Aye. Mr. Sarr? No. Dr. Thor? No. I vote aye. Motion passes by a vote of five to two. <coughs> We'll now move to consideration of the consent agenda. All items with an asterisk are consent matters unless they're removed from the consent agenda at this time. Any item be, may be removed from the agenda by the chancellor as a matter of administrative prerogative or by the governing board upon motion duly made, seconded, and approved. Consent agenda items will be approved by one motion and there will be no specific discussion of these items. Items removed from the consent agenda will be approved during the consideration of the non-consent agenda. Does anyone wish to remove items from the consent agenda? Seeing none, do I have a motion to, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. McGrath. Mr. President, I move for the uh, passage of the consent agenda. Thank you, and do we have a second? I second it. We'll now vote on the consent agenda. Those in favor, so signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed by saying nay. Seeing none, consent agenda passes. We will now move to item 11.2, first of non-consent items. Approval, conceptual approval for construction of a UAV flight lab. Can I get a motion to approve? I move that we approve 11.2. And we need a second. Second. Have a second. Questions and comments? Seeing none, we will go ahead and vote. Those in favor, so signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed by saying nay. Item 11.2 passes. Move to item 12.1, approval of extension of ERP consultants contract. I get a motion to approve. I move to approve 12.1. I second it. Questions and comments? Seeing none, we'll move to vote. Those in favor of item 12.1, so signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed by saying nay. Information items, item 13.1, employee policy <coughs> development. Any questions or comments? Item 14.1, review employments. Questions or comments? Monitoring reports. President Hendricks, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, regarding the information items, I wanted to bring to the board's attention that we did catch an error in the uh, hire report, and so we will replace that document in the board portal. Thank you. Any other comments? Thank you. Monitoring reports, item 15.1, review, review final budget analysis. <coughs> Questions or comments? Item 15.2, 2004 general obligation bonds and 2004 capital development plan summary. Questions or comments? Dr. Thor, do you have a... Oh, okay, I'm sorry. 
Faculty reports. Faculty Executive Council report, Mr. Mitchell. Board President Hendricks, members of the Governing Board, Chancellor, members of CEC, and guests. I have just a few brief comments. First, I'd like to thank the hundreds of community members and faculty and staff and students who came tonight here to express their support for the faculty. I'd also at this time like to make two brief statements. Uh, the first of which is that the Faculty Executive Council has not engaged in activity not explicitly permitted by the RFP. As private citizens, faculty on our own time have exercised our constitutional rights to free speech. Second, none of the fundraising activities you mentioned are the work of the Faculty Executive Council. And finally, I would call upon you to correct the misrepresentations as publicly as they have been disseminated this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Governing Board reports. Mrs. McGrath, do you have a report? No report. Mrs. Livingston. No report. Mrs. Haber. Oh, I'd like to just mention that I enjoyed attending the YMCA congratulatory luncheon, and um, one of the awards was given to our chancellor, and uh, it was really wonderful to see her recognized. And there were others there as well. Mr. Saar. Um, it's late, no report. Dr. Thor. No report. Mr. Bartney. Uh, yeah, I just wanted also to say I enjoyed attending the International State of the State where uh, Chancellor Harper Marinick did a wonderful job of moderating with Governor Ducey and the ambassador in Canada and Mexico. Thank you. Thank you. I have no report. Uh, Ms. Livingston, any report on ASBA? No report. No report. No report, thank you. Um, we don't have a representative on AADGB, but I understand Mr. Sar attended, is that correct? Any report? No. No report. Establishment of next meeting dates. Our next regular scheduled meeting date is March 27th, 2018 at 6.30. At this time, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I so move. I second it. All in favor? Aye. Meeting adjourned.